the fifth face of intention is what I call the face of expansiveness, expansion. And I describe it this way, the face of expansion. The elemental nature of life is to increase and seek more and more expression. If we could sharply focus on the faces of intention, we'd be startled, I imagine, that one of the faces we'd see is a continuously expanding expression of the power of intention. The nature of this creative spirit is always operating so as to expand. Spirit is a forming power. It has the principle of increase, meaning that life continues to expand toward more life. It might look like a tiny speck in a continuous state of duplicating itself and then enlarging itself and then moving forward all the while continuing its expansion and its expression. It's the nature of intention to be in a state of increased expression. So therefore, it must be true of you. To be in a state of increased expression. And it doesn't mean the ego's desire for more. It is instead the desire or the need to constantly be in a state of expanding and growing. That which is alive is growing. The difference between a flower that is alive and a flower that is not alive is that the one that is alive is growing and the one that isn't is dead. So it is my intention to appreciate and express the genius that I am. It is my intention to express the genius that I am. And when I think about expansion and genius, I think of them as the same. Bucky Fuller once had a great quote about genius. He said, we are all born as geniuses, but life degeniuses us. We come to believe that genius is something that is uh, outside of us. It is something that is uh, in something or someone else. It's this awareness that um, I am always expanding and that the universe that I'm in is in a constant state of expansion. We're sitting here in a room and our senses tell us that we're sitting still. But we're not sitting still. We're hurling through space right now at thousands of miles per hour. This whole planet is moving through space at thousands of miles per hour. Now, how long has it been doing this? When's it going to hit the wall? <laughs> I mean, how long can this planet keep going at thousands of miles per hour? It's also spinning on its axis. Every 24 hours, it's spinning. So we are sitting here, believing that we're sitting still, and we're spinning and hurling all at the same time. Not only are we spinning and hurling at the same time, but we're also orbiting this thing called the sun. So now we've got three motions going on. We're hurling, spinning, and orbiting all at the same time, and we think we're sitting here, sitting still. But the universe that we are in is in a constant state of movement. It's in a constant state of increase. It's in a constant state of expansion. And if you want to be connected to source energy, you have to live at the same energy vibration as the source from which you emanated. And this is a spirit of increase and growth and genius and expression. And if you're not doing that, it's the source of this thing called depression, which is something that we see so much about these days. And basically, depression is not possible. It's not possible when you're busy. It's not possible when you're inspired. It's not possible when you're increasing. It's not possible when you're expressing the genius that you are. It's not possible to be depressed when you're inspired, when you're in spirit. When you're inspired by some great purpose, all of your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction. And those dormant forces and those faculties and those talents come alive and you discover yourself to be that greater person by far than you ever dreamt yourself to be, as Patanjali put it. It's one of my very favorite quotes. It's why I use it so frequently.
because it, it is a way of allowing yourself to be in this state where you're back at your source and you're constantly in a state of increase. I know in this moment right now that I'm connected to my source. I know it. And that's why the words are flowing. And that's why the ideas that I want to get out are coming out. Not because I've written them down, not because I've studied hard, but because I am connected to my source. And when you get connected to your source, something called enthusiasm begins to take over. And what is enthusiasm? And theos, the god, yasm, within, the Greek word. This god that is within begins to take over. And enthusiasm is not commensurate with, it's not in harmony with depression. You can't be enthusiastic and be depressed at the same time. So when you have an absence of entheos, enthusiasm, an absence of God within you, you have left your source. And when you leave your source, you leave the power of intention. You no longer can intend what it is that you were designed to become. Remember, you didn't show up from a particle. You showed up from an energy field before you became a particle. And that is God, that energy field. And when you're depressed, when you're anxious, when you're fearful, when you're any of these lower emotions, lower energies, you've left your source. Here's again how uh, David Hawkins, who I love so much, in his Power Versus Force put it. He said, genius is by definition a style of consciousness characterized by the ability to access high energy attractor patterns. That's really powerful. Everything is energy. Everything that you attract into your life is a law of attraction. We are in a universe of attraction. And that genius is nothing more than the ability to attract these higher patterns of energy. It's not a personality characteristic. It's not something that a person has or even something that a person is. Those in whom we recognize genius commonly disclaim it. A universal characteristic of genius is humility. The genius has always attributed his insights to some higher influence. Genius is a characteristic of the creative force that allows all of material creation to come into form. It is an expression of the divine. And what we want to do to see ourselves as constantly expanding is to recognize any moment that I am in a state of non-expansion, particularly in an extreme state of non-expansion. An extreme state of non-expansion is depression, is worry, is anxiety. So that if I am not inspired or expanding or growing in some way and expressing this divine within me and removing my ego from it, I speak at a church in Detroit, oh, about once a year, the uh, Renaissance Unity, it's called. I'll speak for two church services. There's a 9 o'clock service, and there's an 11 o'clock service. And I go in, and I give the 9 o'clock service, and I speak for 35 or 40 minutes. And I walk back into the room and just sort of, sort of meditate now, because I've got to do it again in another 40 minutes or so. It's time to go on stage and do it again. I've done this for the last 25 years, at least once a year. Every single time, the same thing happens. I cannot remember one thing that I just said. I can't remember any of it. I sit there and think, oh, that went so well. People really love that. And my, my relatives who live up there in Detroit, my brother and my uh, nephews and, uh, and cousins and so on, will. Uh, be in the audience and they'll come back and they'll be saying, oh, that was great. And others will say, well, I wasn't there for the 9 o'clock, but I'll be there for the 11 o'clock. Do the same thing again. And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know what I just did. Have, any, have you had that experience of where, where you do something, you paint something, you create some music of some kind, you, you're, there's some kind of creative force going on, 
And this is what happens. This is what it is to connect to your source. This is not you doing it any longer. It's not about you. It's not about this body. It's not about this thing that uh, you believe is who you are. It's about allowing this genius to be expressed by trusting in source, by trusting in it, and knowing that it will never let you down. It'll never let you down. So here are a few of my suggestions for uh, making this intention your reality. The principle of increase and expressing the genius that you are. First, declare yourself to be a genius. This doesn't have to be a public pronouncement. <laughs> you don't have to take out a, a commercial someplace. But make it as a statement of intention between you and your creator. A statement of intention between you and your creator. Remind yourself that you are one of the masterpieces that emanated from the universal field of intention. You are evidence of a distribution of God taking place, which is what Victor Hugo called genius. A distribution of God taking place. I love that. You don't have to prove you're a genius, nor do you need to compare any of your accomplishments to those of others. You have a unique gift to offer this world, and you are unique in this entire history of creation. Two, make a decision to listen more carefully to your inner insights. No matter how small or how insignificant you may have previously judged them to be, the thoughts which you have can be viewed as silly or unworthy of attention, but these are your private connection to the field of intention. Every silly little thought that you have. Do you know that I've had entire books that have been written and sold in the millions that came from a silly little idea? Just a silly little idea. Real magic. I saw a documentary on Houdini and I heard him say, magic isn't just illusion. There's something in the world of magic that is real. There is something that you can... And I thought, Real magic, what a great idea. Called my publisher, I said, I'd like to write a book about real magic. And, and the publisher said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I'm not sure, but I just think it's just, a, it sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? I mean, it's like political science. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's, <laughs> if it's political, it's not science, is it? I mean, you know, or jumbo shrimp, or any of those, uh, those things that we think of as, as oxymorons. Real magic. And then it, it's like it became a book, and then it became a set of tapes, and it like became a, something that I lectured about, and people write to me from all over the world about the impact that this little book about real magic had on them. What seemed to be just a silly little idea. You know, and, and think about the things in the world of marketing. You know, remember Pet Rocks? I mean, how could you have a dumber idea than that? And aren't you sorry it wasn't yours? <laughs> or a hula hoop? Or... Uh, <laughs> You know, and, oh, so many of these little, uh, just some little silly idea that there's potential in every idea that you have. Make a decision to listen more carefully to these inner insights, no matter how petty they may sound. Three, know that any and all thoughts that you have regarding your own skills, interests, and inclinations are valid. See, your thoughts are your way of connecting to source energy. Always the question, the question throughout this entire program, are your thoughts in harmony with the way God thinks? Remember the observation I made about Einstein? I just want to know the thoughts of God. All the rest are details. I want to think like God thinks, and God thinks like a genius, and you are just a product of God's thoughts. Four, Remind yourself that aligning with spiritual energy is how you'll find and convey the genius within you. Hawkins again says this, remind yourself that aligning with spiritual energy is how you'll find and convey the genius within you. It's through the alignment with source. Here's again from Hawkins. From our studies it appears that the alignment of one's goals and values with high energy attractors is more closely associated with genius than anything else. The alignment of our goals and values with high energy attractors. That's what this entire program has been about. Aligning yourself with high 
energy attractors. And what you have to recognize is that everything that you have in your life is from an attractor energy. So you've attracted into your life, consciously or unconsciously, everything that is a part of your life. And that this expression of genius is nothing more than being able to get to this place where you start attracting higher energy patterns by accessing things like intuition, insight, creative thought. This is the internal landscape, the internal landscape of the genius. Trusting in my intuition, expressing the genius that I am. I'm in a natural state of expansion. Next, practice radical humility. This is what I wrote about this. Take no credit for your talents, intellectual abilities, aptitudes, or proficiencies. Be in a state of awe and bewilderment. Even as I sit here, as I'm writing now, even as I sit here with my pen in my hand, observing how words appear before me, I'm in a state of bewilderment. And I am whenever I write. It just bewilders me. Because I think that everything is channeled. Everything is channeled. They talk about channeled literature and A Course in Miracles being channeled. So where do these words come from? How does my hand know how to translate my invisible thoughts into decipherable words and sentences and paragraphs? Where do the thoughts come from that precede the words? Is this really Wayne Dyer writing? Or am I watching Wayne Dyer put these words on the paper? Is God writing this book through me? Was I intended to be this messenger before I showed up here as a baby on the 10th of May in 1940? Will these words live beyond my lifetime? I'm bewildered by it all. I am humbled by my inability to know where any of my accomplishments come from. Practice radical humility and give credit everywhere except to your ego. Next, remove resistance by actualizing your genius. Resistance. Thoughts of doubt about your abilities. Thoughts which reinforce what you've been taught about a lack of talent. You don't have the aptitude. All of these kinds of thoughts are a misalignment and don't allow you to be in vibrational harmony with the universal, all-creating field of intention. Next, look for the genius in others. Look for the genius in others. Pay attention to the greatness you observe in as many people as possible. And if you don't see it at all, at first, then spend some mental energy looking for it. The more you're inclined to think in genius terms, the more natural it becomes for you to apply these same standards to yourself. Tell others that they're geniuses. Remind your children that they're a genius. The ways that we usually measure genius and expansion and expression of genius are through aptitude tests. And I'd like to close out this face of intention with this little story. When Erroneous Owns uh, was published about four or five years later, the people who wrote the um, Iowa Test of Basic Skills, I believe it was that one, uh, called and, and wanted my permission to use a portion of what I had written as a part of their intelligence test. So they would take a paragraph and then they would have the student, or the testee, I never, I never liked calling students testes. I don't know, there was something about that that I had a problem with. But uh, anyway, that's what they are. They would read this uh, little paragraph, and then there'd be four questions about the paragraph that they had just read. All of you listening have had that experience of uh, you read a paragraph and then you answer the questions. And this is designed to measure your, quote, intelligence. So they sent it to me, and I gave them permission, and I thought it was fine. And, uh, and then I said, but I would like you to send me the test back so that I can look at it uh, at, the, uh, at the end when you finished it. And they said, fine. So they sent the whole test back about, oh, a year or two later. Uh, and I got a, this package in the mail, and I opened it up, and here was this intelligence test, the Iowa tests. So I uh, sat down one afternoon, and I said, I'm going to take this test. So I took the test, and I think it was question number 78 or 79, there's a passage from your erroneous zones. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. So I read the passage, and then there's four questions. And I answer the four questions. 
And then I go to the back of the book, to the instructor's manual, which they sent with me, and I find out how I did on the questions about what I had written maybe 10 years before. And I got three, uh, I got three right. I got one wrong. One wrong. And I wrote it. <laughs> so I look at the fourth one, which I missed, and what I missed, the way they explained it in the instructor's manual was, I missed the intent of the author. <laughs> so that tells you how I feel about intelligence tests <laughs> and using that as a way of measuring your genius. It's not about how well you do on an aptitude test. It's about how aligned you are with source, which creates nothing but geniuses. And every one of you listening are an expression of the divine, an expression of genius. The sixth face of intention is the face of abundance. Spoken a lot about abundance here in this program. It is my intention to feel successful and to attract abundance into my life. It is my intention to feel successful and attract abundance into my life. Now, here's the universal source. Here's source energy. And source energy is an endless supply because it is endlessly abundant. So if the universal source of intention is endlessly abundant and you are a piece of that source, then you have to be abundance yourself. You have to think in terms of abundance. The creative source reacts to your belief in shortages with a fulfillment of your belief. The creative source reacts to your belief in shortages with a fulfillment of your belief. Now, what does this mean? If you go to the universal source of intention, with a belief that something is missing and ask this source, which knows nothing about the concept of missing and knows nothing of scarcity because it is only abundant, how can it react to something that you believe is a shortage or in scarce supply? So when you go to it and talk in terms of scarcity to this source from which you emanated, it doesn't do anything but just continue to give you back what it is that you bring to it. It's a law of attraction. And you're bringing a belief in shortages with you to the source. And therefore, you'll just continue to have this reinforced over and over again. It's one of the biggest mistakes that I believe we make in the way that we pray. When we pray to God, instead of using prayer as a way of communing with our source and a request to return to our source. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Let me become what you are. You are peace. Let me be an instrument of that. St. Francis didn't say, Lord, I don't have any peace. Just tough times this 13th century. Things are just not going that well. And there's people all around yelling at us, and there's wars going on here in Perugia, and there's little lower Assisi and upper Assisi are at battle with each other. And my father is a haberdasher, and he wants me to sell clothes, and I don't want to sell clothes. And how am I going to have any peace when I'm with a family like this? And they're always yelling at us. And, you know, Francesco didn't do any of that. Francesco said, make me an instrument of thy peace. How can you give away what you don't have. Here's an observation from A Course in Miracles about healing. No one can ask another to be healed, but he can let himself be healed and thus offer the other what he has received. Who can bestow upon another what he does not have? And who can share what he denies himself? How can you share something that you deny yourself? 
How can you bestow upon another person what you do not have? Well, the same thing is true of God, of source energy. How can you expect source energy to bestow upon another what it doesn't have? It doesn't have any scarcity. It doesn't have illness. So it can't bestow it on upon another person. It denies itself nothing. It denies you nothing. When you come to it with a belief in you've been denied and you have this missing from your life, it will react by fulfilling your continuous belief in this. On the other hand, you can commune with this and become an instrument of what it is that you emanated from, and that is abundance. So you come to it knowing that you are already abundant. In order to understand the face of abundance, this sixth face of intention, you have to be abundance and know that you can attract it to you. You'll notice that people who are good at attracting abundance into their life very seldom put their attention or their thoughts on scarcity. It isn't something that they even think about. I wrote these words one morning in The Power of Intention. The great universe is filled with an abundance of all things, filled, in fact, to overflowing. Think of the face of unlimited abundance as being similar to the ocean. You can approach the ocean with an eyedropper, a thimble, a cup, a bucket, or one million gallon container and make no difference to the ocean, nor does the amount you extract impact the level of the ocean. It's an infinite supply, and you were created from an endlessly abundant supply. It stands to reason that if one of the faces of intention is abundance, then the expression of this abundance is in you as well. You are an expression of this face of abundance. You are an expression of it. Again, consider the opposite. If the power of intention had scarcity as its primary feature, it would express itself with shortages. There would be only so much air, and only so much water, and only so much sunshine, and then we'd run out. Some would get to breathe and to drink it and be warmed by the sun, while others wouldn't. Scarcity would rule our world. But it doesn't, because intention has no boundaries, no restrictions, no limits. And the truth is, neither do you, except as you choose to believe in limitations and weaken your connection to intention. Remember, we're all connected to intention. The question isn't whether we're connected. The question is, how dirty, how corroded is the link? And this is about uncorroding it and cleansing it. Seeing ourselves from the end, seeing the abundance that we would like to attract into our life, that our egos have convinced us is short supply in our life, and already knowing that it's there, already knowing that it's there. You know who's really good at that is your children. Children know how to think from the end in very powerful ways. If they really want something and would like to have it, no matter what it is, they not only will hound you and keep asking, and your no is just to them a minor form of resistance. When my son wanted to get the automobile that he wanted, he had a picture of it put on the screen of his computer so that every time you turned it on, there were like 500 pictures of this particular car. So it's like he had the vision of it always being there, thinking from the end, acting as if. And it sounds absurd, but it's something I've been doing my entire life. It's like thinking as if, acting as if, the abundance that I would like to have in my life. And my son would he'd say, Dad, let's just go down to the dealership and let's just sit in it. I'd say, why do you want to sit in it? You're not getting it. He'd say, I just want to sniff it. I just want to smell it. And I just want to feel what it feels like. And it's, you know, young people, and you all had this at one time in your life, could see what it was that you intended to create as, as if there was just absolutely nothing that was going to stop it. And, and these little delays in having it manifest and show up in your life were just little forms of resistance that you had to learn to overcome. 
That's what nagging is. You know, that's what bugging somebody about it endlessly and over and over again until ultimately, and many times you have to teach them, well, if that's what you really want to attract into your life, then you're going to have to go out and work and get a job and contribute and, uh, and make this uh, your reality as well. Very often their response to that is, I have no problem with that. And I'll babysit, and I'll collect pop bottles, and I'll... And it's like you give them the opportunity to, to instead of... See, one of the, the words that you want to get out of your vocabulary, I'll be talking about in a moment, is the word no. You know, Hafiz, this great poet, once said that, uh, I seldom say no in my life because I've noticed that God's answer to everything is always yes. God is continuously saying yes, 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 to everything that you would like to have and everything that you would like to show up. Yes, yes, yes. Go look at that magnificent ocean. Yes, look at those flowers. And go to the Kuchenhof. Anybody know what the Kuchenhof is? Over in, uh, probably saying it wrong, but it's over in Amsterdam, this place in uh, April or May in Holland where they have, they must have 10 zillion tulips and the different tulip fields, and there's fields of purples, and then there's whole fields, acres of pinks, and then they have the pinks and the purples together, and it's, like, and it's just this, you, you walk through, you spend a whole day looking at nothing but these magnificent tulips. Yes, yes, yes. You want orange and green tulips? To yes, yes, yes. All possibilities. Do you ever go snorkeling? You know, you go, you, look, you go to places where you see snorkeling, and the further down you go, when you go down uh, you know, underneath and, and look in these, uh, when, you, when you go scuba diving, you look down there and there's these creatures, these bizarre, you know, you want a fish that has ears for eyes and it's got its arms out of its ass, and uh, <laughs> we all have that. Yes, we could create that for you. What is, it, what is it that you want, you know? Now they have broccoli and cauliflower that are combined with each other, brocky flower or brocca flower or whatever it is, and you can, you know, you can have, you can combine anything that you want, you know? You want pork chop combined with beef and lamb? No problem, we'll give you a lamb beef pock or something. I mean, it's, it's just whatever you want, it's out there. Yes, 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 yes. The universe says yes. Your children say yes. Yes to everything. Yeah, I'm going to have that. Yep, I want to have one of those. Yep, I want to have one of these. And we find ourselves saying no too often because the universal field of abundance is one that is continuously saying yes. Say yes to life. Here's a little program for making your intention your reality. And by the way, part of this intention is that I intend to attract the right people into my life. Not only am I attracting abundance into my life, but the right people because we don't do this alone. We are all connected to each other. Someone asked me the other day, can I intend for my son the same thing that I want for myself? Can I have that intention? And I said to this woman, the field of energy that we are connecting to is in you and it's also in your son. You're already connected to the same field that he's connected to. All you have to do is put your intention on it. Yes, you can provide it for others. Yes, you can intend it for others. Absolutely, because the same energy field, there's only one field in all the universe. All of us come from it. And the same force that is growing your fingernails right now is growing mine. And the same force that is beating your heart is beating mine. There's only one force. We're all connected to it. When you connect to source at the highest levels, you are in a state of allowing. When you are living at that state, all living creatures become your allies. And you can attract the right people. The right people will show up in every form that you need. I mean, I'm here now speaking in front of audiences all over the world. And if, if I could tell you how it all began, it all began for me just teaching in a classroom. And then having an opportunity to teach in a little town in Long Island called Port Washington, where I was given an opportunity to give a series of lectures. And I gave those series of lectures on a, on a Monday night. Four lectures for $12 or something like that. Three years later, there were a thousand people coming. Never saying no, always saying yes and then knowing that whatever it is that you need and whoever you need. And then it's almost like you get to a place where you start looking for those people. They'll start just showing up in the most uh, remarkable of ways. So here's my way of making your intention your reality. Step one, 
always see the world as an abundant, providing, friendly place. If you think it's hostile and you think there are shortages out there, the universal source of supply will reaffirm your belief. This is a reminder that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. When you see the world as abundant and friendly, your intentions are genuine possibilities. They will, in fact, become a certainty because your world will be experienced from these higher frequencies. Secondly, affirm to yourself, I attract success and abundance into my life because that is who I am. I am abundance. This puts you into vibrational harmony with your source. Your goal is to eliminate any distance between what you desire and that from which you pull into your life. Three, stay in an attitude of allowing. What does allowing mean? It means removing all resistance. What is resistance? Every thought that you have that says it can't be done, I can't do it, I'm not worthy of it, and so on. Allowing means a perfect alignment. An attitude of allowing means you ignore all efforts by anybody else to dissuade you. It means you don't rely on your previous ego-oriented beliefs about shortages. Four, use your present moments to activate thoughts that are in harmony with these seven faces of intention. Use your present moments to activate thoughts that are in harmony with the seven faces of intention. Activating a thought. If you're thinking about feeling sick, if you're thinking about what's missing, stop, activate a thought that is more in harmony with source. Five, initiate actions that support your feelings of abundance and success. It's called thinking from the end. Put your body into a gear that pushes you toward abundance and feeling successful. And act on these passionate emotions as if the abundance and success you seek is already here. Speak to strangers with that passion in your voice. Answer the telephone in an inspired way. Do a job interview from the place of confidence. Read the books that mysteriously show up. Pay close attention to conversations that seem to indicate you're being called on to do something new. Pay attention to all the coincidences. The word coincidence is a mathematical term from coincide. And in mathematics, two angles that coincide are said to be two angles that fit together perfectly. Every coincidence is an indication that something is fitting together perfectly. Step six, remember that your prosperity and success will benefit others and that no one lacks abundance because you've opted for it. There's no poor person in the world who's poor because you've opted for abundance. When we look at this whole law of attraction, we understand that it's all energy. And that the people who need to hear this message the most are the ones who live in the worst of conditions. And they don't need to be fed a diet of you can't help it and poor you and somebody else will do it for you. It's that old, old saying, you've heard it a thousand times, when you teach a man to fish, he eats for a lifetime. When you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. In fact, the more wealth that you create for yourself, the more you will attract it for other people as well. I can say to you very honestly that uh, when I go out there and write a book, that I create abundance for thousands and thousands of people, not because of the messages that are in the book, just simply because of the act of going out and writing one. Somebody has to edit it, and somebody has to dress that editor, and somebody has to feed that editor, and somebody has to deliver those books to the store, and somebody has to build the trucks that are going to bring those books to the store, and somebody has to grow the rubber to put into the tires, and somebody has to feed the rubber growers, and on and on and endlessly it goes. When you attract abundance into your life, you're attracting it into everybody else's life as well. And when you fail to attract abundance into your life, you're creating more scarcity. Next, become as generous to the world with your abundance as the field of intention is toward you. Don't stop the flow of abundant energy by hoarding or owning what you receive. Keep it moving. It's an expansion universe. Next, devote the necessary time to meditate always on the spirit within as the source of your success and abundance. Always meditate. And finally, have an attitude of gratitude for all that manifests into your life. 
be filled with awe and appreciation for everything that shows up. Here's what St. Paul said. God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance. All you have to do is tune into that frequency. The frequency that St. Paul is referring to. God, source energy, is able to provide you with every blessing of abundance. Just be it. The last and the final face of uh, intention is called the face of receptivity. The last face means that there is no restrictions. It is receptive to all. Receptive to all. This is what I wrote in The Power of Intention. The receptive face of intention is simply receptive to all. No one and no thing is rejected by the receptive face of intention. It welcomes everyone and every living thing without judgment. And so must you. Never granting the power of intention to some and withholding it from others. The power of intention is available to everyone and everything and therefore has a face of receptivity. The meaning of universality is the inclusion of all things. Thus, to recognize anything as outside of itself would be to deny its own being. It's therefore impersonal. It's available to all because all originates from it. Again, the meaning of universality is the inclusion of all things. To recognize anything as outside of it would be to deny its own being. It can't reject anything. When Hawkins did a uh, calibration on religion, he found that religion calibrates to a level which weakens almost all of us, organized religion. Because religion is something that divides us and excludes some and includes others. Any religion that divides or excludes is not what the face of intention is. So if this religion that you have or you believe in says that some get to get in and some don't, then it is denying the very face of universality itself. How can it deny what it already is? So that organized religion very often calibrates very low, whereas spirituality calibrates very high because spirituality unites us, brings us all together, recognizes us as one, whereas religion recognizes us as divided up and excludes some and includes others. So that you have to be very cautious about anything that will separate us. I wrote this one morning. Today I arise at 4 a.m. with a knowing that my writing will complete what I've already envisioned in the contemplations of my imagination. The writing flows and letters arrive from intentions manifest abundance, urging me to read a particular book or to talk to a unique individual. And I know that it's all working in perfect, abundant unity. The phone rings, and just what I need to hear is resonating in my ear. I get up to get a glass of water, and my eyes fall on a book that's been on my shelves for 20 years. But this time, I'm propelled to pick it up. I open it, and I've once again been directed by Spirit's willingness to assist and guide me as long as I stay in harmony with it. It goes on and on and on, and I'm reminded always to stay in that place where I am receptive to all. Receptive to all. Back in 1974 or 75, I was trying to get a book published. And my agent set up an appointment with a, a publishing house in New York, Funk and Wagnalls. And I was uh, 34, 35 years old. I was an associate professor over at uh, St. John's University in Queens. I went into the uh, interview, and the man that was going to interview me, his name was Paul, was, um, his eyes were all teary, and his face was red and sort of blotchy, and, uh, and he really didn't want to have an appointment with another aspiring author. But it had been set up by my agent, uh, this man who was to become my agent. And I looked at him and I said, uh, I said, Paul, what's going on? And he said, um, what do you mean? I said, you look so sad. You look as if you're really in pain. 
and he broke down and he started talking to me and sobbing telling me what had happened the night before that his wife had told him that she uh, wanted a divorce they had two children and that uh, she wanted to have custody of the children this came out of the blue to him and I sat there it was one o'clock on a weekday afternoon and I put aside my manuscript and I put aside everything and I talked to Paul for the next four hours he turned his phone off I was a therapist at that time I had a practice out on Long Island and I talked to him about the blessing that was in this and what he could do and that he didn't have to choose to be upset and that there were ways that he could uh, handle this and uh, this was ordained in a certain way by a source that you may not even understand at this point and, uh, and to look for the blessing in it and on and on and on we talked and talked and at five o'clock we became like best friends and I walked out of the office and uh, he was so much relieved and he felt so much better and uh, my agent called me, Artie called me at home and he said, well, he said, how did the interview go? I said, it went great. We had a great afternoon. He said, well, are they going to publish your book? I said, I said, oh, forgot to talk about that. He said, what do you mean you forgot to talk about that? Do you know how long it took me to get this appointment? And it went on and on and on with all. And I said, uh, well, we'll get around to that. I said, but I said, he was just in a state and it just felt that it was necessary for me to. And uh, two days later, Paul called Artie and said, uh, I don't care what he's written. I don't care what the book is or what it's about. I want that man as one of my authors. And that book became your erroneous sounds. It was published by Funk and Wagnalls, later T. Y. Crowell and later Harper Collins. Paul and I worked together for a long, long time. Uh, and the lesson behind that is that you have to want for others more than you want for yourself. The face of receptivity to all means I am open to you, I suspend my ego, and I offer you what it is that I would like to have myself. I offer that to you, and I suspend what's on my mind in terms of what my ego says is the most important thing I have, and I'm open to you, I am receptive to you. This face of receptivity to all is a very, very powerful idea. I call this making your intention your reality. It is my intention to attract ideal people and divine relationships into my life. So making this intention your reality. Here's a program for implementing this intention. Move away from hoping, wishing, praying, and begging for the right person or the right people to show up. Move away from that. Know that in this universe that works on energy and attraction, that you have the power to attract the right people, to assist you with any desire, as long as you practice keeping your ego out of it. I attracted somebody into my life who was able to publish that book, and from there, everything that I needed to flow flowed for me. Two, conceptualize your invisible connection to the people you'd like to appear in your life. If you'd like to have an ideal relationship, show up. If you'd like to have somebody to help you with your business, conceptualize yourself as connected to them already. And then three, form a picture in your mind of meeting the people you'd like to have assist you or be in partnership with you. Just form a picture of that. And then act upon this inner picture. Begin to act as if everyone you meet is a part of your intention to attract ideal people into your life. Make calls to experts who might be of assistance and state your desires to them. You just put it out there. You put it out there and then you let go. And then you detach and you have the patience to know that the universe will make it all work in divine order. Take the path of least resistance. Here's some resistance. This stuff isn't practical. I just can't materialize my ideal person for my thoughts. Why should I be treated any better than all of those who are still waiting for Mr. Wright to show up? I tried this before. I got an incompetent boob for my efforts, and so on. On and on the resistance goes. And if you have that kind of resistance and you think in those kinds of ways, that's exactly what you'll attract. And then practice being the kind of person you wish to attract. Who do you want to attract into your life? Relationships, work, business, 
family, whatever it is. If you want to be loved unconditionally, practice loving unconditionally. If you want assistance from others, extend assistance wherever you have the opportunity. If you'd like to be the recipient of generosity, practice being as generous as you can. This is a simple formula and one of the most effective ways for attracting the power of intention. Be what it is you would like to attract. Just be it because it works as a law of attraction. And finally, look on everyone who has ever played any role in your life as having been sent to you for your benefit. I love this line. In a universe peopled by a creative, divine, organizing intelligence, which I'm calling the power of intention, there simply are no accidents. So that's the seventh and last of these seven faces of intention. The idea that the universal source excludes no one and doesn't play favorites. We are all, each and every one of us, a part of that receptivity. What I'd like to talk about for just a few moments is the impact that you will have on others as you adopt this uh, attitude of knowing and staying connected to the seven faces of intention. What impact will you have on other people? Most of them I've talked about throughout this program. The first thing that you'll notice as you feel yourself reconnecting to Source is that when you are in the company of others, you will instill calmness in others. When people are living at higher levels of energy than you are, and you approach them, no matter where it is, whether it's a gathering, whether it's uh, in your home, whether it's in business, or even with strangers on a streetcar, wherever it might be, there is something about the energy that you have, wanting to feel good, wanting to feel God, that allows you to make others feel calm and safe in your presence. Whereas the opposite is true as well. When you are living at very, very low energies in which you are constantly fighting and competing and having to win and playing the ego game, others feel anxious when they're around you. Anybody who wants to argue with you and wants to fight with you, you just lose your sense of calmness. So that's the first thing. The second thing that you'll notice about others, and even in your own family, is that others will become energized by being in your presence. The thing that I think is most intriguing about the impact you'll have on others is that you'll begin to feel better about yourself. When you're around someone who is living at these energy levels, and all you have to do is spend a few minutes in conversation with them, and you walk away, and you feel attractive, and you feel important, and you feel as if, um, I've just been around someone who reinforces what a good person I am and that I'm valuable. The next thing you'll feel or you'll notice when you're around these people and when you are one yourself is that others will feel unified. They'll feel connected to rather than separate from. They'll feel as if like we're all in this thing together and they'll want to cooperate. They'll also feel purposeful. The opposite is true as well. You ever notice that someone who wants to argue with you all the time, how your immediate feeling is you want to get away from someone like that? And you walk away from it and you don't feel as good about yourself and you don't feel unified, you don't feel connected. Higher functioning people, you have a tendency to have your energy level ri rise by being in their presence. You also feel inspired to greatness, inspired to your own greatness and to attract greatness into your own life. And finally, you feel aligned with God. You feel as if there's nothing, absolutely nothing, that can stop you. You really have something called being connected to God. Connected to God. That's the impact that you'll have. And you won't even know that you're having it. Sometimes you'll walk through a crowd and others will just feel better just because you walked through the crowd. When Mother Teresa walked into a room, everyone in the room felt their energy raise. When Jesus walked into a village, his presence in the village would raise the consciousness of those around him. I'm going to go through what I call the dire dozen. 
This is the thread that winds its way throughout this entire program. This is the thread. One, want more for others than you do for yourself. That's how God works. That's how intention works. Want more for others than you do for yourself. Two, think from the end. That is, see yourself as already having accomplished and show up in your life that which you feel is missing. Three, be an appreciator rather than a depreciator. When you appreciate, you add value. When you add value, you become that valuable thing that you were when you went from formless to form. Four, know that you are an object of well-being. You emanated from a state of well-being. Five, notice resistance. Resistance is the form that is taken in all of the thoughts that say, I can't have it, I can't do it. Six, contemplate yourself as surrounded by the conditions which you wish to have in your life. Contemplate yourself. Remember the law of flotation was not discovered by the contemplation of the sinking of things. Seven, remember the law of allowing. Allowing is taking the path of least resistance. It is your ability to summon from the universal field of intention all of the energy of intention. Eight, practice radical humility. Leave your ego at the door. Nine, be in a state of gratitude. Be grateful for all that shows up. Be in a state of awe. Ten, remind yourself always you cannot relieve a problem by condemning it. You cannot solve a problem by condemning it. Anything you condemn means that you attract the condemnation. Eleven, play the match game. Play the match game. Match up with the field of intention. And finally, 12, meditate. Always meditate. Meditate to the sound of creation. Practice japa, as I talked about in Getting in the Gap, or the CD we put out seven or eight years ago now called Meditations for Manifesting, available through Hay House. There's a woman who lives in India. Her name is Sri Matajai Devi, D-E-V-I. And she said, these are the four things that you'll have to have to reach enlightenment. She is an enlightened master who travels the world giving lessons. I love these, and I wanted to conclude this program with this. She said, number one, you cannot know the meaning of your life until you are connected to the power that created you which is what this entire program has been about. Two, you are not this body, you are not this mind, you are the spirit. And this is the greatest truth. Three, you have to know your spirit, for without knowing your spirit, you can never know the truth. And four, meditation is the only way you can grow. There's no other way. It's how you make conscious contact with God. It's a great summary of this entire program. And I'd like to close with one final little story that someone sent to me a few months ago. And it was about a 92-year-old woman. This 92-year-old petite, well-poised, and proud lady who's fully dressed each morning by 8 o'clock, with her hair fashionably coiffed and her makeup perfectly applied. Even though she's legally blind, today she's moving into a nursing home because her husband of 70 years recently passed away, making this move necessary. After many hours of waiting patiently in the lobby of this nursing home, she smiled sweetly when she told her room was finally ready. As she maneuvered her walker to the elevator, I provided a visual description of her tiny room. 
including the eyelit sheets that had been hung on her window. I love it, she stated, with the enthusiasm of an eight-year-old child who just received his first puppy. But Mrs. Jones, you haven't even seen the room yet. Just wait, just wait. That has nothing to do with it, she said. Happiness is something you decide on ahead of time. Whether I like my room or not doesn't depend on how the furniture is arranged. It's how I arrange my mind. You see, even if you're legally blind and 92 years old, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. God bless you all, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.